Bibles with you, turn with me to Genesis chapter 41. We are not going to read verses 1 through 36 again. And everybody said, Amen. <laughs> took a long time. I went back and looked at the video. It took quite a while for me to read 36 verses. So I'm not going to read that again. But I want to remind you... Um, um, the, uh, this, is the, this is the passage of Scripture where the, the leader of Egypt has had a dream, has actually had two dreams, and he has uh, gotten word that uh, Joseph is able to interpret the dreams. And so he has called Joseph from prison and, um, uh, to interpret his dream. And so we reminded you last week, that we depend today not upon dreams. I told you uh, several weeks ago, God can appear to you in a dream, but we, uh, we rely on God's holy word for our direction. And if God gives you a vision or a dream, it will complement it, it uh, God's holy word. It will not change or contradict uh, God's holy word. Then we talked about uh, three sets of two. There were two dreams, uh, 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 to prophesy, and there were two dreams to position, and then we said finally there were two dreams to prove, and that was verse 33, and the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. You had that, and then we talked primarily um, in, in part one about the hard lessons of time. Verse one, then it came to pass at the end of two full years. You remember um, Joseph had asked the butler uh, to remember him when he was restored and two years passed by. And so we talked about the hard lessons of time. We said, first of all, it was God's plan and not your plan. That's a hard lesson for us to learn sometimes. God's plan and not our plan. God's plan is the best plan, by the way. Uh, we tend to negotiate with God. We want to bargain with God. We want to explain why our plan's a better plan, but God's plan is the best plan. And then, not only is God's plan the best plan, but God's timing is always best. Sometimes, you know, God's told Joseph what's going to happen in the future, but God did not tell Joseph about the pit. God did not tell Joseph about slavery. God did not tell Joseph about being accused of rape or attempted rape. God didn't, God didn't share those things with Joseph. Uh, God knew that it was going to take some time uh, to to um, affect his will uh, for the nation of Israel. And so God's timing is best and God's timing is best in your life. We said that God's plan is purposeful. We said James 1, 2, and 4, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, the trying of faith works patience, but let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire. God is working in your life. God is working in my life. The difficulties and the hardships and the adversities have purpose. And let me invite you when, you, when you're going through a valley, to ask God to show himself, to help you understand. We rejoice. We said last week or two weeks ago, really three weeks ago, when we talked about Joseph uh, interpreting the dreams, Joseph wasn't a grumbler. Joseph wasn't complaining. Joseph was uh, being a good servant of God in the place that he was, although it was not the place he wanted to be. And so God's plan is purposeful. And then we said, finally, God's plan requires trust. Uh, folks, you have a finite mind. God has an infinite mind. God can see tomorrow. You cannot. God knows what's down the road for you. He knows everything. And so... God's plan requires trust. Uh, one of the disadvantages of our brain is that as thinking people, we evaluate and reason and calculate and, and, we, and we begin to think, well, if this happens, what about that? What am I going to do if that happens? What am I going to do with this? What am I? Listen, you're going to trust God no matter what happens. I like what uh, Elizabeth Elliot always said. She said, we're going to do the next thing. 
We're going to take it one day at a time, trusting in God. So that's where we stopped um, two weeks ago, the hard lessons of time. Now, Pharaoh's had two dreams. He dreamed, he dreamed about the, the cows eating the cows, and, and Joseph uh, is giving him uh, the interpretation of those dreams. Uh, I'm going to go on uh, down to, um, I'm going to open up my Bible real quick uh, to Genesis and look at that dream real quick, just as a, just by way of a reminder. Um, in verses one through seven, um, he says, "And it came to pass at the end of two full years, the Pharaoh dreamed, and behold." Uh, he stood by the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow, and behold, seven other kine, and that's cattle, came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river, and the ill-favored and the lean-fleshed kine did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kine, so Pharaoh awoke, and he slept and dreamed the second time, and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good, and behold, seven thin ears blasted with the east wind sprung up after them, and the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And so that's the dream, just by way of reminder, that, um, that Pharaoh had. And now let's look at the weaknesses of the world's wisdom. Verse eight says, now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men and Pharaoh told them his dream but there was no one who could interpret for Pharaoh the dream. Popularity, popularity is not with the majority. Not with the majority. 1 Corinthians 1.26 says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Pharaoh reached out to the academics of his day. He reached out to the sorcerers and the magicians of his day. He reached out to the think tanks of his day for answers and interpretations. He reached out to the contemporary uh, thought process uh, of his day and it provided absolutely no answer for him. Why is that relevant in your life and my life today? Listen, as a believer, we tell people things that the world around us does not accept. We say the world was created in six days and on the seventh day God rested. The world said it took b uh, billions of years and in fact it's still going on right now. We say there's nothing new under the sun and we say that everything that ever was created was created created by God and for God and the world rejects those ideas. And so we aren't going to be in the popularity uh, place. We aren't going to be in the majority. We aren't going, our, our position is not going to mesh with the world's. So when you tell people you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, He's your Savior. You're redeemed. You have a home in heaven. You don't fear death anymore. You know that when you die, you will wake up in heaven. When you tell people that, you can say that with confidence because you aren't trusting in the wisdom of this world, but you're trusting in the wisdom of God's holy word. And so uh, uh, popularity, not with the majority. Wisdom is not with the majority. Secondly, position, not with the mighty. Hey, I don't know about you, uh, uh, but as a young man, uh, we, we, <laughs> we have uh, young men growing up have kind of a Lord of the Rings thing going on in the community. Who I, I never will forget, I, there was a bully, I think it was probably in about the fifth grade for me. And a big guy, a big guy. And he, he bullied me absolutely every day. I would avoid him every way that I could. And finally, I could not avoid him anymore. And one day, I just hauled off and kicked him as hard as I could in the bad place. It didn't do anything. He still whooped me. Um... And so uh, just being the mighty doesn't always get you where you're wanting to go. 
This guy was big, and, uh, and, and he was bigger than me, and he whipped me. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we look at the world around us. We look at our circumstances. We look at what's going on, and we fear the mighty in our world. But in this case, in this case, God's not going to use the mighty. He's not going to use the prominent. He's not going to use the people of power. He's going to find the answer whiling away in a prison. What, and I might add, an indefinite sentence. Joseph wasn't serving a five-year sentence or a 10-year sentence or a 15-year sentence. Joseph was in prison for the duration. And God said, that's where your answer's at. And so, not with the majority, not with the mighty, and not with the most likely. Then the chief butler spoke to the Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day, when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in a custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. We each had a dream, and one night he and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard. Like I said, God chooses people from unlikely places to accomplish his will. And I rejoice in that. I rejoice in that. You know, uh, the, the Golden Valley Crusaders sing a song about uh, uh, the record book. And you're not gonna, there's not going to be marble statues established for me. There's not going to be any monuments erected uh, for me. But God chose me. And uh, I have a home in heaven. In fact, uh, he's preparing a place for me, a great place for me. And I rejoice that God has chosen men and women like me and you all over the world to be the emissaries of Christ, the ambassadors of God on this side of eternity to tell the world, that old gospel song, I'll tell the world, to tell the world what Jesus has done for them. I'm suspect I've told you this before, of believers who, who are afraid to tell people that they're a believer. I can't help but tell you I'm a believer. And if you're having a conversation, I was at the barbershop the other day, and I sat down between, beside an absolute rank stranger, and within three minutes, we were both talking about church. He turned out to be a believer, but I didn't know that. He, we, started, we struck up a conversation one with another, and I started talking about my church. And uh, just so happened that he was a member of First Baptist in Rutherfordton. And so we had some kinship there. But listen, you're not a secret agent. You're called by God. Amen. And you don't, God's not looking for, uh, <laughs> let me tell you this too. I'm not looking for redemption from Washington. I've told you that before. I'm not looking for redemption from the uh, executive branch, the judicial branch, or the legislative branch. I'm looking for redemption from God Almighty. And folks, you and I can have power with God and all the, you don't have to be the sharpest tool in the shed. You don't have to have 42 degrees. You don't have to have attended the highest schools of learning. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in his word, you have power with the king of the universe. And so it's not about popularity. It's not about position. And it's not about your placement. Weaknesses of the world's wisdom, they're going to... They, <laughs> we saw it again. Just recently, we went through the pandemic. The, the world had all the answers and yet none of the answers. None of the answers. And purposeful, not with motive. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put the shame or put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to, to shame the things which are mighty. God <laughs> chose you and me who weren't the most educated, who weren't the richest, who weren't the mightiest, who weren't the people in the highest positions. He's chosen us so that he might demonstrate at the end of time that it wasn't you and me that did it, but it was him that did it. And I, you know, Paul said, I, <laughs> I have nothing to boast but Christ and him 
crucified. You know, that's a caution that we have to have as Christians. Sometimes we get ahead of ourselves. God's been richly good to us. He's blessed us in a mighty way. And we think, if we're not careful, that we've done something special. Listen, God has done it all. If you're a smart person, it's a blessing of God. If you're an attractive person, it's a blessing of God. If you have an education, it's a blessing of God. If you have a good spouse, it's a blessing of God. If you have good parents, it's a blessing of God. If you've got food in your refrigerator, it's a blessing of God. If you've got a place to go to work tomorrow, it's a blessing of God. God's done it all, and that's the reason on the last days we'll throw our crowns before God and give Him all the glory because it is Christ and Him alone where we find our glory. So the weaknesses of the world's wisdom, it's not the popularity, it's not position, it's not placement, but God has a purpose for what we do. He deprives the trusted ones of speech and takes away the discernment of the elders. Oh boy, that's a, that's, a, that's a scary verse for me. That's what I see going on in our world today. He deprives the trusted ones of speech and takes away the discernment of the elders. Pharaoh called the, the smartest people he knew and they couldn't answer. And we now have the smartest people out there saying that there's 72 genders and that a man and a woman don't need to know what sex they are. That they can pick that. And parents can't even, you know, (laughs) you can pick and choose genders at the hospital. What do you want your child to be? Billy Goat. I don't know. It's, It's just that silly. It's just that silly. But smart people are wanting you to believe these things. Smart people, educated people are wanting us to believe these things. Folks, have confidence in the word of God. The world around us does not know truth. And just as the world around Pharaoh didn't know truth, and they found truth in a Hebrew, Joshua in a prison is going to answer their questions for them. The humility of the righteous. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Oh, there it is. The mark, the mark of the true believer. It's not in me. It's not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer. Joseph has come out of prison. He's not complained. He's not gone. Well, it's about time. I've been down there. I told that, but, uh, that butler of yours two years ago. Where's he at? He, that we don't hear that. He comes before Pharaoh and he says, the answer is not in me, but my God has the answer. And folks, you need to tell people your God has the answer. When people are talking about you or talking to you about a relationship that's not working out, you need to tell them, my God has an answer. When, when you're struggling with, with children that aren't doing what they want to do, you need to say, God has an answer. When you're struggling with a job decision, you need to say, God has an answer. No matter what it is, God is the answer. And we see the humility of the righteous demonstrated in Joseph. No anger is demonstrated. Hey, folks, God doesn't give us license. Now, people, here's, here's what we say. I'm not angry, preacher. It's righteous indignation. Hey, don't candy coat it. Don't pretty it up. If you're angry. Now the Bible says, it doesn't say you can't be angry, but it says angry, be angry and sin not. We have to be careful with our anger. And Joseph doesn't come with anger on his heart. He doesn't come with, 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 uh, um, I'm going to get you. You did this to me, and I'm going to get you. There's no arrogance in his heart either. I'm the dream discerner. Hey, you know, (laughs) I've told you before, I believe in divine healing. I don't believe in divine healers. If I were a divine healer, I would go down to Rutherfordton Hospital, and when I got down there, cleaning out the, the wards, 
I'd go to Shelby Hospital in Spartanburg Regional, and, I'd, and the 6 o'clock news would be following me. I wouldn't set up a tent outside town and charge you and sell you prayer cloths and magic oil and all those things. The, 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 I would be healing people and watching them get up. And the evidence would go before us of the power of God. So I believe that God does divine heal. I, I pray for the sick. And if I, didn't, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't pray for sickness. But I don't believe in divine healers. Some folks will fall out with me over that, but that's okay too. And, uh, but uh, he didn't have any arrogance about the fact that he, had interpreted, that he had interpreted those dreams. He didn't come, yep, I'm the man. Book stops here. But he didn't have any apprehension either. Hey, are you doing what God's called you to do? Do you have confidence enough in God to go where God takes you? I'm going to tell you, there's been, there's been things that God's called me to do when I felt ill-equipped and unqualified to do them. But I step out in faith and say, God, I'm going to lean on you. I don't, I don't have the answers. I don't have the ability. I don't, I don't know why you're using me, but I'm going to go anyway because I'm going to trust in you. To, to walk me through this situation and this circumstance. And that's what God desires of each and every one of us. Emotions in check. Not arrogance because of who we are. And no apprehension with the power of God in our lives. Now the dreams are revealed in verse 25 through 32. I'll read those real quick just by way of refresher. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Pharaoh was not a born again believer. God was not on his side. God was on the side of the nation of Israel and God was, was creating the circumstance to bring up Joseph to the position to be able to redeem the nation of Israel. Egypt's going to benefit. Pharaoh's going to benefit. Joseph's going to benefit. But the purposes of the dream were for God. So, now, the wisdom of God applied. And I like this because it goes along with our Sunday school lesson this morning. It talked about teamwork and our need for one another. When God does a thing, God is not chaotic about how he uh, takes it to place or how he makes it happen. First of all, God called a man. God called a man. Now listen, that could be, um, and we're not talking about the position of pastor right now, the, so ladies don't shut me out. God calls women too. There's been, I, I, you can go down to Penal Prayer Center in Cowpens, South Carolina, and uh, Bertha Smith, great missionary to China uh, for years, gave her heart and her life. And we could, Lottie Moon, Annie Armstrong, we could go on and on about great women. But in this particular case, God called a man with a dream, with a vision, with an interpretation. And God calls leaders in our lives with a vision. I've told people this. In fact, uh, my boss at my uh, uh, secular profession uh, wrote a book. And she asked me permission, could she put this on the back of the fly leaf in the book? And it's there today. And I said this to her. I said, if I could stand at the door and inoculate everybody on your way out with a vision for God's potential in your life, I would do it. But I can't. You have to have a vision 
for what God can do in your life. I can cast the vision. I do that every Sunday. I can cast the vision, but you have to catch the vision. You have to believe God has a will and a purpose in your life, and you have to set out to, to, to engage yourself in the mission of God. God has a method. God told um, Joseph, let's look at this. He says at the end of this, let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seventh plentieth year and let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn upon the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities and that food shall be for the store in the land against the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land perish not through the famine. God has a plan. God has a plan. God has a plan for First Broad Baptist Church. God has a plan for you in your life. And God, God uses you and me to accomplish His will. But God, God laid out a specific plan. We don't know where... You talk about divine inspiration. Joseph... Well, what, let's look at Joseph's credentials. Uh, Joseph graduated from the University of Nowhere. Uh, Joseph was a 17-year-old, so he had no time to go to any uh, formal lane, uh, learning. He was a nomad uh, wandering through the desert, captured, sold into slavery. He spent 11 years as a slave in the house of Potiphar. Now perhaps he learned some administrative skills there. But God gave him a plan. And God will give you a plan in your life. Now it starts with understanding God's word. You know people, it scares me when people say God's given me a plan and it don't match up with this word. God's plan does not involve us being <laughs> where we're not supposed to be. God has a method. God has a mandate. What's your mandate? Well, our missionary shared that with us last week to go into all the world and do what? Make disciples. That's your primary purpose as a born again believer is to tell others what Jesus has done for you. That's your primary mission. We spend all of our time saying, God, what are you going to do for me? God, give me this and give me that. Give me, give me this, give me that, give me this. But that's, our, that's, our, that's our prayer life. I like that song, came out I think in the 70s. My house is full, but the fields are empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems that all my children want to stay around the table, but no one wants to work in my field. No one wants to work in my field. God, God has a mandate for your life. And God's going to bless Joseph, but it, our, our life isn't about what God gives us. Our life's about what God will do with us if we'll give ourselves to Him. And then there's a measurement. Uh, Tony and some of you others may appreciate this. We, we set goals in the secular. Uh, Al's been through this too. We set goals in the secular world. What's a good goal, Tony? There you go. You got to be what? Measurable though, doesn't it? You got to be measurable. If you, if you create a goal, the first thing, is it measurable? So how do we measure what God does, what God has called us to do in our lives? I, I will say this, and I'll caution you on this. People will say, I'm a poor Christian. I've never won anyone to Christ. Well, uh, if you've never witnessed to anyone, that concerns me. But Jeremiah preached all his entire life and never won anyone to Christ. Our responsibility is to tell people it's God's responsibility to save people. And I, let me say this though, if you tell people, you're going to see some people get saved. Because God's going to, there's going to be an intersection in your life and God, you're going to have the message somebody wants to hear and you're going to share it one day and it's going to surprise you 
They're going to say, that's exactly what I've been looking for. How do I get that? And don't say, let me call the preacher. <laughs> Turn over to John 3, 16. It said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God said in Romans 10, if you believe in your heart that God, that Jesus was raised from the dead, confess with your lips, you shall be saved. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. God will do the rest. God will do the rest. Well, and that's measurable. But let me, I wanted to say that too. Listen, if you me, don't measure your Christian effectiveness, the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of God. Don't measure your Christian, spirit, uh, your Christian effectiveness solely on whether you've been a soul winner or not. Measure your Christian effectiveness on whether you've been obedient to God. Because God uses, and we all have different uh, talents, and if you look at that, uh, uh, some the gift of evangelism, but not to all. And I think when God gives the gift of evangelism to people, uh, you see um, the fruits of people like Billy Graham, where thousands come. And if Billy Graham were alive, he would tell you, that's not me. That wasn't my message. That wasn't the cleverly crafted formula that I came up with for the service. That was the power of the Holy Spirit and me being obedient to share the message. I like, uh, I like Billy Graham. Uh, the primary reason I like him is because all of his messages are simple, easy to understand, easy to understand. And God said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Well, I don't know what you're battling with today. I don't know how this message fit into your life. I don't know what decisions lay before you that you need God's hand but God is alive and well today and desirous to serve or to have you serve him and to demonstrate his power and his presence in your life in a mighty way. We're in an election year. Yeah, let me give you the best election advice I can give you. First of all, vote. Secondly, vote your conscience. But most importantly, pray for God's will to be done for the nation of America. That we, and he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. If you're not praying, if you're not praying, there's a problem. There's a problem. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You are responsible for that relationship. You can blame the preacher if you want to. You can blame your parents if you want to. You can blame your spouse if you want to. But when you stand before Almighty God at the end of time, God will say, what have you done with what I have done, given to you? And you will give account to God for your responsibility, not for the responsibility of those around you. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. Let me just encourage you to do business with God. I've already shared with you. If you don't know God today as your personal Savior, um, Give your heart and your life to Christ today. It'll change you. It's going to change you. If it didn't change you, then the Bible would be a lie. But it's going to make you happy. It's going to give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you're born again, but you just haven't been living the way God's called you to live, you know it. You didn't have to, the preacher didn't have to tell you you weren't living right. You know it. Holy Spirit's been telling you that. Won't you make that right this morning? Confess your sins. Get yourself back in a right relationship with God today. Whatever your need is today, let me encourage you to do business with God as we sing.